the title or topic is is the fire before us the fire before us and um oh lord i need help today uh it was one of those things where as i was reading that the Lord brought something to my attention and, and I just really couldn't shake it. And so I'm trying to be sensitive to where God is leading me to talk about. Um, and, and, and I, and I can't help, but to, but to, but to feel and trust that this is it. I don't know who this is for. And, and again, maybe it is for all of us. Uh, and, and I just pray that as I go forward, maybe the Lord will even open up my eyes and show me how it's for me too. Um, but we're going to trust the Lord to go to talk about this, the fire before us. Um, amen. I want to read. I want to start off with Exodus. Look, Exodus chapter three, verses one through five. This part is in King James, in the King James version. But Exodus chapter three, verses one through five. And it reads like this. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And and he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. Verse four. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to God, uh, excuse me, and when the Lord saw he, that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not hither, put off thy shoes from thy, off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. I'm going to be, uh, I don't have a ton of scripture today. And I have more notes than I know what to do with in looking at this just this very short passage right here. Um, there's so much uh, family that we can gather out of here and so much that that God is uh, teaching us and through the demonstration of how he dealt with Moses. Uh, Moses absolutely uh, had had audience with God like no other man that we see um, on the earth. And it's for a reason. And we ought to start looking at when we see men like this. Uh, we ought to start looking for clues um, as to what's going on and and what 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 can I do um, and how can I have this kind of relationship with the with the Lord. Um, a couple of things I want to do. I want to try to just kind of set the foundation on a couple of things. Now Moses has this interesting cycle in his life. I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, you know, he was raised. He was supposed to be killed. The mom said he was a beautiful boy. Put him in the river. Uh, I think Pharaoh's daughter found him. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. Uh, he he's got, came into a crossroads, and we know that eventually he had to flee from Egypt because he was wanted for murder. Um, and now he finds himself married uh, to Jethro's daughter, and he finds himself um, where he used to be in the palace. Now, let's put it like this. this it says that he kept the flock of Jethro, which is to say that he didn't even have the flock. It was Jethro's flock, and Moses then becomes like an assistant shepherd. Now, in these times, even to this day, uh, a shepherd is one of the, the lowliest uh, of careers in this time. So you go from being in Pharaoh's house and having great riches and pleasures and, 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 and spoils and all these things um, to being the assistant shepherd. Don't even have your own animals um, that you take care of. Uh, from your father-in-law. And so it's a, a really low state that Moses finds himself in. Um, now, Horeb, the Mount Horeb, the, the word Horeb means uh, desert or desolate. Um, which So this, this mountain, this area is a very desolate area, a very desert type of area. So uh, even Jethro must not have been very wealthy because he didn't live in the fruitful land of the valleys like we uh, like are described uh, where Lot and Abraham were, particularly Lot, um, where he looked and he saw the green area, he went there to go set up his camp. Uh, we find Jethro in a more desert place in Mount Horeb, and the lowly Moses is keeping the flock of his father-in-law in this desert mountain area. Now, a couple of things about the bush. Now, if the if the if the area is desert. 
then the bush that burned that, 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 that the Bible talks about had to be a very brittle and dry bush to begin with. When I begin to think about this as I studied, the first thing I started to think about is, is tumbleweeds. And I don't know if anybody's ever lived out in a desert area, um, unfortunately. <laughs> I spent some time in Rialto. Oh, man, I don't even like to admit that. Um, oh, man, I'm struggling. Ah, my mighty when you move with Amen. Uh, and I've seen a couple of tumbleweeds set on fire. I'm not saying I started the fire. Looking at my kids, y'all better not be, don't be like your dad. Uh, but I've seen some tumbleweeds go down in flames. And now, Faith, I, y'all don't know the story? Oh, man, I set the field on fire? Oh, man, uh-oh. All right, uh, I told you I was a bad kid. Anyway, um, these tumbleweeds, they go down like this. And so Moses, obviously, being, a, being in this area for a while, uh, he's in, in the, and there's often times in these desert areas that lightning might strike and set a little fire as it as it gets on, uh, on as it finds fuel, finds dry brush. So M- Moses has p- certainly seen this dry brush catch on fire before. But however, he sees this dry brush and something's different. Whereas in the other ones he saw where they just kind of crumbled and disintegrated in a, in a short span of time, this one continued to burn. Now, we don't know how far that bush was from him when, the, when it caught on fire, but uh, he begins to make his way towards this bush. And in whatever time span that takes, even as he approaches this dry bush and this dry land, it's still burning. I'd like to say that even through the flames, he could see the disposition of the bush and the structure of the bush uh, being as if it wasn't on fire. Amen. And so this is... Uh, Interesting because this is really talks to the how God how it is that God gets our attention. And Moses is at work, equivalent to our day. Um, And it would be even probably a little bit more tricky to work for your father in law. But at work, and he uh, and he and he his interest is piqued in this bush that is burning. And I I say that and I harp on that because this is kind of what it's like when when God calls us, that there may be something, a simple thing in life, but there's something different about it that God is trying to get our attention. Now, of course, in our day, we're so busy. Uh, We we uh, we work hard. We have a culture of um, going the extra mile. These companies are trying to get you to work 50, 60 hours a week, uh, paying you for 40, but putting pressure on you. Um, I've been looking at di- various job descriptions lately. I'm looking at some of the ones that uh, that make sense for me. They're asking people to have eight or nine skills for the pay of what they paid last year for two or three. And so th- the world we're looking at, at is, is looking to make work your life to the point that you just miss out on everything. But But Moses, while he's keeping the sheep of Jethro, he comes and this bush gathers his attention. And he draws himself into it. Now, I want a couple of points I, I, I want to make um, regarding reverence. And I pray that you guys are with me. It's ironic that when, when Moses comes before the presence of this fire, that God tells him to take off his shoes. Aren't the sandals fitting for, shirt, for dirt? Moses had been walking around through all this dirt. And what was ever on his sandals was probably on his feet, too. And the reason why I'm saying this is because this is the mindset of the church today is that, well, I'm of this world where I came from. This is the way I dress and this is the way I talk. So when I come to God, I'm going to keep it real and be who I am. We live, amen, in this dirt this filthy state, this filthy world. But when we come to God, we ought to take off our shoes, which means to say that we ought to have a little bit of reference when we come unto God. Now, this is a whole nother message and a whole nother lesson, but I got to say it anyway, is that when, when it's time to do something for God, it ought to be a difference between how we respect God's thing and God's house and God's work than how we would do maybe even your own house or somebody else's house or this thing or that thing. 
And it, it would be quite fitting. It, would, it makes perfect sense that Moses would keep his sandal on to, because in, the, in our sense, that makes more sense that, it, well, if he puts his feet on the dirt, then, and we're supposed to be clean before the Lord, doesn't he become more dirty as he takes off his sandals? Right? This is the way we begin to justify how we uh, bring God down to make him relevant. But the fact of the matter is, God created the dirt, man created the shoes. And what God is saying is much bigger than I'm not worried I'm about your feet being dirty. What he's saying is that, hey, you're coming into my zone. You're coming into my territory and I won't share my glory with another. So when he said to take off your shoes, he said that, look, hey, that thing that, that man has created is separating us right now. I pray somebody's with me. It's separating. I'm, I, I want to strip you down and break you down of all these worldly ways that when you come to me, amen, I got you. I don't want I don't want the hood version of you. I don't want the corporate America version of you. I don't want the politically correct version of you. I don't want the seminary school vision or version of you. Amen. I don't want the way I act in front of church in front of you. And I don't want the Sunday version of you. But I want you. But we come to God, amen, in these ways, amen, that where he's not able to bring us to the point of where he wants to, and he's not going to share his glory with no one else. Now, interesting as well is that these sandals, what they represent is, is our feet, and what our feet represent is the way we walk. And the way we walk represents the way we live. And so above and beyond this moment of God bringing Moses down and not having a separation between, amen, the things of man and the things that God has created, it also for him, for Moses and for us, represents this moment of surrender. When we take off our shoes before the presence of God, this is a moment of repentance right here. Lord God, this makes no sense to me, but I'm uh, but I know that there's something about this bush. I know there's something about this fire. I know there's something about this moment. Amen. And so when God says to take off his shoes, he's, what he's saying is, hey, repent, surrender unto my desire. Because the place that you come on is holy ground. And, and, and if you want to live for me, I'm going to make an offer to you in just a moment. If you want to live for me, amen, then I need to, I, I can't have anything separating, amen, my presence from, uh, from you. And I, when you come into holy ground, you have to recognize, amen, that the, um, there's a greater thing than you that is right here. There's a greater thing than your shoes. There's a greater thing than you can imagine. And when we take off our, our shoes before the presence of God, recognizing his holiness, then we are submitting to the fact that his ways are past finding out. And it's a moment for us to say, Lord, I'm going to live my life according to you. I'm going to be obedient in this moment. But even further, Lord God, when you extend this thing to me, I'm going to walk with you. I don't want to walk in my shoes no more, but I want to bear, put my feet to the ground. Hallelujah. Where you can lead me. Amen. And so we have all these beautiful parallels that are going on uh, right here. Um, in this moment that God has with Moses, and it's such a powerful moment, I definitely encourage everybody to read it if you haven't before. And and I wanted to I want to I want to share an idea. Holiness is a life lived according to the knowledge of God. It's pure and it's clean. Now, what do, what do I mean by that? You know, I think a lot of times we try to define what holiness is, and I think a lot of times the the easiest way that a lot of the church forefathers and leaders try to describe holiness is to give you a list of things. Um, the best way is to say it is that it's a life that's a life that's lived according to the knowledge of God, knowing how holy he is, knowing he's pure, knowing he's right, uh, knowing um, uh, that he takes wants no part of sin, knowing that he wants no part of these things. And so God brings Mo Moses to this, this opportunity to surrender his life unto him and to come into a life of holiness. Amen. That is to live according to the knowledge that God has given us, not trying to be the captain of our own salvation, not being a God unto ourselves, saying what's best for us. Amen. Uh, not even to the point that, you know, these systems of, uh, of human morality are none of these things, but living a life according to the knowledge of God. 
This is important for us to remember this. Now, I want to start to get to the core of what I want to talk about today uh, regarding this fire. Let's 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 read it one more time. Titus, can you put it up? Exodus. And I want to look at verse two. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now, I think a lot of times when when we think about this fire, I think a lot of times uh, we preach it and teach it as if God is the fire. But the Bible says that the angel of the Lord is the fire. And this is going to be this is going to be critical for our understanding. You know, when I begin, first started to think about this, I was sharing with Sister Faith. The first thing I thought about was that in Eden, you can take it off, T, when when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, God put up some angels when I believe it said they had swords of flames that went all every direction that separated Adam and Eve and their fallen nature away from the presence and power of God that they once had access to. And so when we come into Moses, uh, coming to uh, uh, here in Exodus chapter three, we now again see God using an angel to be fire, to separate himself from the sinful man. I'm, I'm actually done preaching with this thought right here. This is it. That there was a separation between God and Moses. Now, let's understand why this is necessary or why God does this. Now, the fact of the matter is this angel that is a fire is appointed by God to keep a separation well, doesn't God love us and only want to come to us? Yes, he does. And I'm, I'm going to address this in this message. Absolutely, he does. But there's a very, there's a reality, amen, to the purity and holiness of God in which that God has to do this. And as I think about that, I think about us is that how sometimes we want to come back to the presence of God. Uh, and this may have been our initial moment, moment of faith, but I believe that there's these moments before the flame throughout our lives that we want to come back to the presence of God. We, 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 we desire to be for God, but God appoints and ordains a fire to separate us from himself. Now, I said God ordained a fire to separate us from himself. Faith and I have been talking about, I don't know why we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, that he's a great and terrible God. That as holy and righteous as he is, there's a particular reality to how holy and righteous he is, that he cannot deny himself, nor can he minimize his righteousness. And I think a lot of times that we want God to we want God to come down to our level. But even as we see here in this occasion, that as God comes down to the earth and yes, the earth is beneath him. Amen. But it doesn't change his holiness. It doesn't change who he is. Amen. He's still utterly righteous and pure, whether that he be in the cosmos or whether he puts a piece of his of his presence. Amen. Uh, before us here on the earth. Amen. It doesn't change. He's holy, amen, no matter where he is. When he reached down to the gutters where we were, that's where he found me, he was holy then. Okay. And I couldn't come to him and call him my homeboy or, or what's up, dude, or none of that. But when I came to him, there was a humbling that had to happen with myself, and I had to take my shoes off. Amen? Did somebody have to do that? Amen. There was a humbling and a stripping down of myself when I had to repent and when I had to come to God. Amen. I didn't ask him to lower himself because he would be no good to me at that point. If he's not God and if he's not holy, then I'm better off do, trying to do this thing on my own. But the fact of the matter, he is God and he is holy. Amen. Uh, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And so, I, uh, so this is uh, what was happening, that God is separating and putting a fire between us, and it's ordained for a purpose. Now, we know that, that, that fire has all sorts of symbolism in Scripture, um, but we, we, we mostly see that God uses fire as a mechanism or a medium, amen, to purify a thing. I think the Proverbs talk about it. I've even preached it a couple of times um, when you talk about the precious metals such as silver and gold and how these things have to go through a very, very difficult and hot fire that they might be purified, that they might come forth as what, Mama J? She may not hear me. Pure gold. 
that they might come forth as pure gold. And we know that the more impurities it is, then the more heat that is needed, amen, to be able to purify it. Amen. And so, um, and so we find Moses in this moment, and, 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 I, and I know that we've all been to these moments where we wanted to come back to God, amen, but we weren't ready yet. We, we wanted to be back in his presence, but we weren't ready yet. And as bad as we wanted him and needed him and it cried out to him, amen, we just couldn't come to him like this. We just couldn't come to him like this. Amen. You know, we talk about the Bible says that uh, well, by the, uh, when Moses asked God if he could see him. And he said, look, you can't see me, but I'll allow you to see the back of me as I walk away and pass by you. Now, we know that God's not a man, but it's his presence that sweeps by Moses. And, and, and at the appointed time, Moses is able to see his presence leaving, but he's not able to come face to face with the presence even after Moses went through this particular purification process himself. And this is the reality of, of us as well, is that unless we go through the process, and this is not a one-time process, saints, amen, I can tell you in my life, there's been, a, there's been a constant cleansing, there's been a constant purification, and it may not, and sometimes it's because I may have gotten distracted, amen, it may be sometimes that I've gotten myself puffed up, amen, it may be just because God, this is just the next thing that God needs to do. But there's a fire that comes before us. I want to look at uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 3, verses 12 through 5, 15. This is New King James. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You can keep it up for a minute. Let that resonate. Let me read that last verse. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. I'm going to make this message very short today. Thank you, Jesus. That's good, T. Amen. This is, I remember reading this for uh, the one time, it was a few years ago, since we started Promise, and I didn't understand exactly what this meant or how to handle it. Um, and I know that as we study, we come into plenty of scriptures and passages that we don't know how to handle. Don't, don't run away from them. Come to them, pray about it, uh, meditate on it, ask God for understanding. Maybe if there's a brother or sister, amen, you ask them, hey, what did you get out of this? Amen. Don't run from these things. Um, this, this passage it means so much. Now, when we look about look at what this means, that there is a reality. I'm going kind of going past Moses now. I'm, I'm really looking at us, and which we begin to build and do works unto God in the very best of our abilities and in the very best of our intentions. And as as we be begin to mature in, in Christ, we begin to. Uh, you know, go into other territory. We begin to be more, uh, more boastful and bold in God, and and we go here, we go there, and uh, we're we're doing our very best to study and learn, and we're we're watching old preaching videos of various pastors, and uh, we're we're picking up books, and we're doing these things, and we begin to build, Amen, on the foundation that maybe even God has set for us Himself. You know, one of the reasons why I'm not afraid of those who I'm their pastor about what you may be picking up outside of promises because I, I, I believe and I trust this process right here. So, 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 so listen to this as, I, as we begin to go this direction. Sometimes as we begin to do works that we feel are, are righteousness unto God, we begin to build things that actually separate us and take us further away from the thing that God wanted us to do in the first place. And we add a little bit here and we add a little bit there. And maybe we had this understanding and we really mean well, but we, 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 we thought this and then we did this and we said this. 
and we begin to go off on our own as the big boys and girls that we are built up in faith to do the works of God. And sometimes we absolutely get it wrong. I, I get it wrong. And I think that sometimes as brothers and sisters, we even see our brothers and sisters start to get a different understanding than what we had. Or they begin to listen to this particular pastor or preacher that we're like, oh, I don't know about that. And we begin to build up on the foundation that we have in Jesus Christ, the same one that the apostles uh, preached and that we still uh, live into this day. But on that foundation, we begin to add other works out of the very best of our intentions and our meanings. And we did it with the heart to please God in complete faith, trusting that we actually heard him right. But we didn't. This is why, you know, I remember when we were starting Promise and somebody basically alluded to the fact that Isaac, you know, you just can't sit there. And if you feel this is what God's calling to do, you just jump out there and you might make a Holy Ghost mistake. But but it would be better for you to make a Holy Ghost mistake than you to sit there on God's vision and never do nothing. This is why I'm not, I, 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 I give this advice to a lot of people. Look, if you think you heard from God, amen, then you must move forward. And God, no, God says that he's weighing motives. He knows what our intentions of our heart are. A lot of times we make our mind to please God in something. Amen. And we're, when we're doing this thing, and it's very innocent and pure, amen, from our intention and our heart to do this thing. But then as we go forth, it's revealed that this wasn't from God. And the thing that, that, I, that I'm not afraid of is that God says this right here. That I'm going to wait, I'm going to test every work of my saints, of all the brothers and sisters in Christ, that they have built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, of, of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And I'm going to put everything in your life before my fire. And there'll be certain things that you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in faith that receive a reward. You heard me. But there'll be things that we do in our intention to serve God and serve his people in complete faith that were not of him. But he doesn't say, I'm going to send you to hell, you heathen, because you got it wrong. But what he says is, I'm going to burn it up, that work that you did. I'm going to burn up that ministry that you started. I'm going to burn up that idea that you that you adopted. I'm going to burn up that principle that you somehow picked up on that video. But my fire is intentional. Because through this fire, I'm going to destroy anything that, that you may have picked up that wasn't of me. Because I'm going to receive you. The fire that separates us is the same fire that we come through that purifies us that he might receive us. Amen. This fire is not to destroy us. God's intention was to never destroy Moses when he set that fire. But unless I set my fire before you, amen, amen, you won't be able to come to my presence, amen. And if you pick up anything that's unlike me, amen, you may hold on to that thing. But if you trust me and you keep your shoes off, if you will keep your shoes off, brothers and sisters, if you will live for me in righteousness and holiness, I'm going to bring you through the fire again and again and again and again. But my, that fire may be hot and it may be uncomfortable. But if you go through this thing and if you endure it, amen, I'm going to burn off anything that you picked up that I don't want you to have part of, amen, for my glory. And I'm going to bring you back. And everything that you did pick up that was of me, I'm going to reward you for, amen. And everything that I burned is going to save your soul. It's going to save your soul. You know, I was... Dealing with a, I'm dealing with a lot here in Turkey regarding the teachings that are going forth um, to these to the saints here. And uh, the devil is, is at work. 
and he's busy. And, and he's trying to create these other ways. When we come to the flame, when Moses comes into this flame, the Bible said that he begins to try to turn aside. Now, he was already walking to the flame, so he's not, he's not walking this way. The flame's over here. He's turning aside this way. He's walking to the flame, and he says he's going to turn aside. What does that mean? I think it means that he was going to try to circumvent this fire, that he was going to try to see what is it that's beyond this bush that's keeping this thing burning? What is this power, and what is this glory? Is there a way around it? Can I receive this power, and can I receive this glory without the fire? And as I begin to think about this, amen, you know, the devil is still whispering the same thing. You won't surely die. And it looks like this. Sister Faith and I are talking about this. Oh, you don't really have to get baptized. You won't surely die. Oh, you don't have to really be filled with the Holy Ghost. You won't surely die. Oh, the Holy Ghost don't really look like speaking in tongues. You won't surely die. But the Bible said that there's only one way. And there's only one fire that kindles that has the power of God in it. And that fire is ordained by God for every single person that would surrender and submit themselves. Amen. That desire to see him. Amen. In glory. Yes. There's one fire. We don't go around it. We can't get around it. That's good. There's one fire that's appointed for every man. And if we would tumble ourselves. And we would endure it. And we would take it for his word. That fire is not there to kill you. It's to save you. And if God didn't set up that fire, you would die. The Bible gives us this idea that if any sinful man came into the presence of God, he would burn up and die. So you have two choices. You could either deal with the fire while you have an opportunity to be purified and see him, amen, uh, in his glory, or you can uh, be burned eternally in, in damn hellfire and damnation because you didn't, you tried to go around it. Okay. Or you saw it and you said, that's going to hurt. I got to turn around. Jesus. God has not put baptism, repentance, holy living as a thing to sit here and watch us go through uh, through these hoops, be, ha be hamsters in a wheel, chasing our tail. Amen. It's not that. Fine. These are the only ways in which we might be saved. Amen. If I don't repent, I cannot be saved. If I'm not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, I cannot be saved. If I'm not filled with his power, I cannot be saved. And if I, there is no demonstration of that power with something tangible, like, like speaking in tongues or prophesying, how do I know I got it? Hallelujah. Amen. God is not a tyrant making us go through these things to prove that we're worth it. It is the only way that he can receive us is through this fire. The only way he can receive us. It's through this purification process yes. and not just once, but it's a continual purification that he's so kind to bring us to not to burn us, not to make us uncomfortable, not to make us feel shame. Amen. Not to show us that how holy he is and how unworthy we are. It is the only way that he might receive us. There's no way around it. When Moses, Moses tried to look around and turn aside, he said, Moses, hey, this is holy ground. There's no other way. There's no wisdom of man around this fire. There's no philosophy that can get you through this process. Amen. But this is holy. It's my way. It's a pure way. And it's a right way. And this fire, Moses, if you would, uh, it is ordained for you. This fire I set before you. I called an angel from heaven. Some of y'all don't realize that some of these things that God has put you through, God has ordained an angel, amen, to come to your presence, to create this fire. Amen. Because he loves you that much, because he had to bring you through these tough situations that you might see yourself, that you might understand where you are, that you might understand that you still need a savior, that you might see yourself. Amen. In the sinful nature that you are, that you might come to him and repent and ask him to heal us.
Thank you, Jesus, for every angel of fire that you set before me. I didn't know what it was, amen, that was set before me, but it piqued my interest. It got my attention. I was busy at work. I was busy doing life. I was busy being this. I was busy doing that. But God set forth an angel as a fire when a bush that could not be burned, amen. And he came to, he allowed me to come to it. And he allowed me to see that this thing is holy, amen. And he yeah. told me, if you would just take off your shoes, brother Isaac, if you would just repent, and live for me. This fire that I have for you, I'm going to bring you through it. And guess what? That thing that you're curious about is my presence. And when you come through this fire, amen, I'm going to receive you as my own. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm done today. Amen. We thank God for